They're playing in the middle of the day, and it is really fucking hard to be a sick metal band when you're playing at lunchtime in a parking lot, right? But they did it. They brought that absolutely savage live show every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and welcome back to episode number four of my How They Got Big series, in which I reverse engineer how important bands got big. Today's episode is about one of the most important metal bands of the last 20 years, Slipknot. I actually met Clown once side stage at a Hate Breed show. He told me he was in some band called Slipknot, and I was like, yeah, right on, man. I'll keep my eyes open for it. I thought he was just your typical guy punishing me about his band that I would never hear from, and obviously, I could not have been more wrong. A couple quick facts about the band for anybody who may not be super familiar. They were founded in 1995 in Des Moines, Iowa by Sean and Paul, and since then they have sold over 40 million albums. They put out five DVDs, they've got four platinum albums, and they have two Billboard number one albums. And they won a Grammy for best metal performance in addition to being nominated for a whole bunch of other ones. But to me, what's most impressive is their legacy. Their second album, Iowa, went to number three on Billboard despite being full of breakdowns and blast beats and extreme vocals. I think this is the album that opened up the doorway for the whole generation of metalcore and deathcore bands that blew up in the 10 years or so to follow. So how did a nine-piece band from Des Moines, Iowa, of all places, end up selling tens of millions of albums, filling arenas all over the world, and opening the door for an entire generation of bands to come? I'll do my very best to answer all those questions in this video, so let's get into it. Key factor number one is Clown's creative vision and the band's great packaging. Now, you've heard me talk about how important it is for bands to have great packaging, and by packaging, I basically mean everything that isn't the music. So that means their videos, their artwork, their stage production, merch, all that stuff. And Slipknot, obviously, are the masters of this shit. Their masks, the jumpsuits, their personas, their live production, all of that is just executed so fucking well from day one, and that was, in my opinion, the key that unlocked the door to all their other successes. But what I think is not so obvious to most people, what a lot of people don't understand is how strategic and calculated it was. They knew they were going to have to do something special to get noticed, especially because they were coming from Des Moines, Iowa, which had no real scene for them to use as a stepping stone like bands from, say, LA or New York did. And the mastermind for their whole plan was Sean, aka Clown. As most of you probably know, the band was co-founded by Clown, and he had an absolutely crystal clear vision for their packaging from the very beginning of the band. To say he was strategic about it would be a huge understatement, actually. He was just like laser focused on this to the point of being obsessive. Here's a little clip from Banger TV that shows what I mean. And I'm going to tighten up every loose end from the way we tie our shoes to the way we play, to the way we look, to the way we act, to the way we talk, to the way, the, the way we walk into a venue. I'm going to tighten it all up and it's not gonna fail, and it's gonna be noticed, and if it's not noticed, I'm gonna kick the door in. Now, you've probably heard a lot of guys in pathetic, failed local bands say the same kind of stuff I know I have, like, bro, you don't understand, we're gonna take over the industry. But the difference is that unlike those guys, he and the rest of the guys in Slipknot have the talent and the work ethic to actually pull it off. And a lot of people, I think, don't realize how key he is to the band, because in terms of the music, he's just a percussionist, but he's the architect of the whole band in a lot of ways, and they arguably wouldn't be here without his vision. He actually went to school for creative writing, so he has a formal background in this stuff. He's directed a bunch of their videos. He's directed videos from Motionless and White and Hollywood Undead. He directed a movie called Officer Down, and he's even published a 250-page photo book called The Apocalyptic Nightmare that kind of documents scenes from the road with Slipknot. And when they came out, you could not help but notice. Whether you thought it was cool or you thought it was dumb, you couldn't ignore it. You had to at least stop and see what the fuck was going on. Like, who are these guys in the masks and the jumpsuits. All of this stuff kind of culminated into a live show that was absolutely savage, and that, their live show, is ultimately what attracted the attention of the person who would take the band's career to the next level. That person is Monty Connor, the head of a &R for Roadrunner Records, who released their first album, which really kicked off their career. And for those of you who don't know Monty, he is the guy that signed probably half your favorite metal bands, a few of which include Typo Negative, Biohazard, Suffocation, Deicide, Obituary, Gojira, Fear Factory, Sepultura, and literally dozens of others. So he is pretty much the man, and he is a huge believer in the importance of the live show in terms of a band's success, and it's one of the number one things that he looks for. Here's a little quote that illustrates what I'm talking about. For the type of music I sign at Roadrunner, which is lifestyle, all the bands will live or die based on whether they're able to 
kill it on stage. Live performances are the true test for any lifestyle bands. It's where they really sell it. So yes, the live show is key. The glut of bands online and their ability to reach kids makes it more important than ever to stand out in person. The live show is what separates the men from the boys. So you can see how the packaging and specifically the live show is the thing that really made everything click for them. And once they were signed, the live show continued to be the thing that fueled the growth of the band. It took them from being a successful metal band on Roadrunner to a Billboard Top 10 mainstream success. And if you were to point to one specific thing that kicked it all off, on the back of the success of their debut album, the band opened for OzFest in 1999. And look at this, these guys are just going the fuck off. Even though they're playing at like 1 p.m., they're playing in the middle of the day, and it is really fucking hard to be a sick metal band when you're playing at lunchtime in a parking lot, right? But they did it. They brought that absolutely savage live show every day on every single OzFest, and they earned themselves thousands of new fans every day. And here is another quote from Corey about how important OzFest 99 was for them. You have to go back to 1999, our first major tour, said Taylor. OzFest gave us an incredible opportunity, and we were able to really jumpstart our career from there. The great thing about being a part of OzFest was that you really were immediately a part of a family. They kept working, kept grinding, kept bringing that savage live show every day. And after that first album, which came out at number 51 on Billboard, which is respectable, the next four, you can see the just huge night and day difference here after OzFest. The next four went to number three, number two, number one, and then number one again. So that is key factor number one, Clown's creative vision and their great packaging, which brings us to key factor number two, truly great songs that cross all kinds of genre boundaries. And I'm putting this second because although great music is a necessary condition for succeeding at that level, it's not enough on its own. There's lots of bands with great music that don't ever reach their level. They knew this, and this is why they put so much emphasis on the packaging. But here's the really important thing. They didn't rely on it as a gimmick like so many other new metal bands. It was just the thing that would grab your attention, make you give them a chance. And once you did give them a chance, you realize that their music was extremely fucking good. The obvious comparison here is with Mushroom Head. They had a similar kind of thing going on in terms of their image, but in terms of their music, with all due respect to the Mushroom Head guys, they were just not half as good as Slipknot. And the difference in their career arcs of these two bands speaks for itself. The thing about Slipknot that you need to understand is that they take their music extremely fucking seriously. And this might sound obvious, but it's not. As I talked about in some of my other videos, I work with music producers for a living, so I see how a lot of albums are made. And you'd probably be shocked by how many bands really don't take their music seriously. They show up to the studio with half of the songs unfinished, with riffs they can't play, just really sloppy shit like that. And I'm talking about big bands that you would have heard of. And it was no different back then. You could tell that a lot of the new metal bands put way more effort into their image than they did into their songs, and that's why they flopped. But Slipknot were the exact opposite of this. They approached their music with the exact same level of like crazy intensity as they did their packaging, and always, always, always insisting on the highest standards. As an example of what I mean, let's look at what they did with their music before they ever even got signed. First of all, they spent $40,000 recording their first demo slash album called Mate Feed Kill, which came out in 1996. $40,000 is a lot of fucking money for a broke ass Midwestern metal band 22 years ago. And this tells you a lot about how much they were willing to put into their music. I guarantee you they didn't have 40 grand just sitting around to spend on a demo, but they did it because they believed in themselves and their music. And that's how seriously they took it. And then in 1998, they recorded another demo that they were using just to shop around to labels. And I can't find out how much they spent on it, but I guarantee you they didn't cheap out on it. And you know this because it was actually good enough that the version of Spit It Out on their first album is the version from the demo. You can tell because it sounds different from the rest of the album. So think about this. They'd been a band for three years. They weren't signed, but already they'd made an entire album. They'd made another demo and they'd invested well over $50,000 into the band. That is dedication. And again, you may think this is obvious. You might think all bands work this hard, but they do not. Ask yourself how many bands you know that are spending $40,000 of their own money recording an album before they even have label interest compared to how many lazy bands expect to get signed off nothing more than a band camp and an Instagram account. And let me get into specifically what makes their music so great, how you can tell that they consistently hold themselves to the highest standards. And I could do a whole other video about what they do in terms of songwriting and arrangement because there's just so much to talk about there. But to keep this video somewhat brief, basically the big thing about Slipknot's music, in my opinion, that has made them such a massive band is that it draws from and touches on so many different subgenres of rock and metal while still being unique. It makes the music accessible to a really wide range of people, but still undistinguishably, unmistakably Slipknot. As one example from an early song, let's look at People Equal Shit. 
look at how many different genres this song references and draws from while still feeling like a very coherent, consistent song. First, it opens up with this really discordant blast beat part with like a death metal grindcore kind of feel. Then it goes into like a new metal single string bounce kind of riff. And then at 143, it goes into a chorus that's almost like a hardcore two-step kind of part, which to be honest, wouldn't be very out of place in a terror song. And then the bridge at two minutes in with the drums and the scronky guitars almost sounds like something out of a Dillinger or Converge song. And the whole time they're layering on these electronic and industrial elements that add depth and interest and give it a unique feel without being clumsily bolted on like so many of the other bands in their genre who tried to do that stuff. And that's just one song. If you look at their catalog, you can see that they do everything from death metal to hard rock to ballads, and they pull it all off. So you put those two things together, these great songs that draw on a wide range of influences from different genres of metal with these insanely good performances, and you have Key Factor number two, their insanely great music that crosses all these genre lines. And Key Factor number three, last but definitely not least, they built a tribe. What you need to understand is that Slipknot has done way more than just sell a lot of albums. What they've done is build a tribe of incredibly devoted fans that are going to support this band for life. As most of you guys watching this know, their hardcore fans call themselves maggots, and I want to specifically talk about how they built this tribe of maggots. What they've done is make the band much bigger than themselves. It's, it's really more about the tribe than it is the band. The band are the champions for the tribe. They're speaking up for all the people out there like them. These fucked up, disaffected kids out there in places like Iowa who feel lost and left out, and when they hear somebody who's fighting for them, who who's standing up to be their champion, they become more than just fans. They become members of that tribe for life. The most crystal clear example of this is their song Pulse of the Maggots from their 2004 album, Volume 3, The Subliminal Verses. I fight for the unconventional, my right and it's unconditional. I can only be, be as real as I can because advantages, I never knew the plan. This isn't the way just to be a martyr. I can't walk alone any longer. I fight for the ones that can't fight. And if I lose, at least I tried. Like how good of a rallying cry is that? That. This us against them kind of vibe is so powerful. And although this song is from 2004, this has been a part of the band's DNA since day one. In fact, here's an interview from way back in 2000 when Corey's explaining the origins of the masks and the jumpsuits. It came about as our anti-image message. You know, we're not really worried about what cool hairstyle we have or what cool clothes we're wearing. We're about our music first. With the coveralls and the masks, it takes the emphasis off of a cool guy rock star image. And I want to be really clear about this. I think he means that. Although Although I do think this idea of a group identity of a rallying cry has been a huge part of their success. I don't think it's some sort of cynical calculated move. I think it's really who they are and I think they really do care about advocating for their people. But getting back to the point, what they've done is leverage the power of group identity because as humans, we're programmed to want to be part of something. We are tribal creatures and when the band or the artist aren't just entertainers, but they're leaders of a movement who defend and advocate for the members, that is an insanely fucking powerful thing. Thing. A couple other examples of artists who do the like named fandom tribe thing are Lady Gaga's Little Monsters, the Black Veil Brides Army, Black Label Society. And if you're familiar with these bands, you can see how the same kind of dynamic applies of defending and advocating for this group that feels oppressed or disadvantaged or left out. And there's other bands that don't have a name for their tribe, but have the same kind of dynamic. My Chemical Romance, for example, they're the champions for all the depressed suburban emo kids. Five Finger Death Punch is another great example of this. Again, I don't think their tribe has a name like maggots, but they speak for that working class military guy that feels like he's getting fucked by the world. And you can see how powerful that has been for them. And this is why Slipknot is going to have a thriving career for as long as they want to play music. If they want to keep playing for another 25 or 30 years like Black Sabbath, they won't have any problem doing that because they have a tribe. Because here's the thing, although a pop artist or a rapper might sell more albums or sell more tickets in the short term, those genres are just entertainment. They're not a lifestyle like rock and metal are. And what that means is as soon as the audience gets tired of their song, as soon as they're sick of the cool song of the summer, they're on to the next thing and the artist's fan base is oftentimes gone along with them. That's why you see so many one hit wonders in those worlds. But rock and metal, like I said, that's a lifestyle. And if you can connect with the community like Slipknot has, you have a tribe of loyal supporters. So are gonna stay with you for life. And that is key factor number three, that they built a tribe. All right, guys, so that's it for this video on Slipknot. If you like 
liked this one, check out my other ones on Bring Me the Horizon, Fall Out Boy, and A Day to Remember. Stay tuned for the next one, and let me know in the comments what you think of this. What did I miss about Slipknot? What other bands would you like to see me include in future episodes of this series? Let me know in the comments. If you haven't already subscribed, I would love it if you would do that. If you're already subscribed, or for some reason you do not want to subscribe, I don't know why you wouldn't, please like the video, leave a comment, share it with a friend. Whatever you can do to help spread the word would be very much appreciated. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.